From the opinion pages of the Wall Street Journal, this is Potomac Watch. Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky addresses a joint session of Congress as the House Ways and Means Committee votes to release President Trump's tax returns. Welcome, I'm Kyle Peterson with the Wall Street Journal. We are joined today by my colleagues, editorial page writer Jillian Melcher and columnist Kim Strassel. News of this surprise visit to Washington broke only a day or so before it happened. But on Wednesday, President Zelensky, wearing his trademark olive green military dress, met with President Biden and then addressed Congress. Here is a piece of what he said. I believe there should be no taboos between us in our alliance. Ukraine never asked the American soldiers to fight on our land instead of us. I assure you that Ukrainian soldiers can perfectly operate American tanks and planes themselves. <laughs> Financial financials assistance is also critically important, and I would like to thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for both financial packages you have already provided us with and the ones you may be willing to decide on. Your money is not charity. It's an investment in the global security and democracy that we handle in the most responsible way. One of the themes to my eye was gratitude. He said several times, thank you for the military aid that's been provided, and thank you for the financial aid. Jillian, I wonder what you make of President Zelensky's speech. You know, I thought it was a really good speech. I thought he was right in framing this as a fight to protect freedom, to protect international law, and to prove to a potential aggressor that no one can succeed in violating borders. And and that gratitude was really important because, you know, the U.S. is sending a lot of money, a lot of military equipment over there. But I think the broader point, he's absolutely right on this, is not charity. It is an investment in global security. Under Mr. Putin, Russia has ambitions of imperialist expansion. And it is Ukrainians who are fighting and dying to contain that so that it doesn't spill over into NATO territory where the U.S. would be obligated to act. So I think he's making the case that this is not only the right thing to do, but it's very clearly in U.S. national interest and that far from charity, it's an investment. Kim, what about that argument that the U.S. is investing here in the Ukrainian fight for democracy against an authoritarian like Vladimir Putin? I mean, one of the critics criticisms you hear, particularly on the right about this aid, is that we've sent a blank check to Ukraine and there has been too little oversight of where this money is really going. Yeah, it's kind of a nonsense argument, especially fighting right now as the Senate prepares to pass a $1.7 billion omnibus stuffed with earmarks and everything else. If you're worried about American dollars, you know, maybe start with some oversight at home. But the reality is here, look, we are defeating Russia. The Ukrainians might be the ones out on the field, but we are benefiting from it. And more importantly, we're doing it for peanuts. If you go and you look at the numbers, so Congress is about to give about $45 billion more to Ukraine. That will be for next year's spending. All right, this comes as we passed an $838 billion defense budget, or are about to. That comes out to that Ukrainian investment for next year, about 5.4% of military spending. And what have we gotten for that so far? Well, the numbers show the Ukrainians have wounded or killed upward of 100,000 Russian troops. There have been 8,000 confirmed losses of armored vehicles, tanks, armored personnel carriers, artillery, uh, hundreds of aircraft, even naval vessels. We have destroyed nearly half of Russia's conventional military capability. The Ukrainians have. That's extraordinary, given that Russia is one of our biggest foes out there in the world, certainly trying to cause mischief for the United States. So if you put that into perspective, we are, through the Ukrainians, handling one of our greatest threats for a single digit amount of our defense budget with no loss of U.S. lives. And that's one of the things I really liked about Zelensky's speech as well, too. Yes, he was very thankful. He was very humble and very grateful. But he was also very blunt about what Ukraine is doing and what it needs from the United States to continue doing it and why America should want to do it. And I like that part of his speech as well, too. But another question that's often raised is, where is this conflict? Where is this war going? And a piece of what Zelensky said was it would be naive to wait for steps toward peace from Russia, which enjoys being a terrorist state. Russians are still poisoned by the Kremlin. The restoration of international legal order is our joint task. 
Jillian, can you give us a sense of where you think this conflict is headed and what Ukraine has offered in terms of peace proposals and the question of what they can accept versus what Putin can accept? Yeah, I think Zelensky was right in framing this as the goal is Ukrainian victory, only victory, and absolute victory. That is how wars end. You drive people to peace negotiations through victory. And I think one of the concerns that Ukrainians have, they're looking at the experience in 2014 when you had Russia enabling separatist movements in Donbass. And there was a hasty, internationally pressured peace settlement there. And what that allowed Russia to do is bide its time, build up its equipment, and then choose what it perceived to be an opportune moment to open a full invasion of Ukraine. And I think the concern is that if they are not able to reclaim their territory, if there is a negotiated peace that is not premised on Ukrainian victory that that basically sets things up for Putin to do the same thing again, to wait and to attack again from a stronger position after Russian troops have had a break and had a chance to rebuild their artillery and recover a little bit. So that's the underlying concern here. You know, Ukraine has had some incredible counteroffensives. You look around Kharkiv, how much territory they've reclaimed. You look at Kherson, which they did really creative things with the HIMARS that the United States provided. So I think this can go one of two ways. If Ukraine has what it needs to continue the offensive, its morale is still high. Continue that counteroffensive and we'll continue to drive the Russians out. But I think the underlying concern is that if Europe and the United States kind of keep them on a shoestring, it makes it much more risky that this falls into a frozen conflict or a stalemate. And again, that looks a lot like what we saw in 2014, and that benefits Putin ultimately. Well, Jillian, do you have a sense of what else the U.S. or NATO allies could provide to Ukraine. President Zelensky, in his speech, did not make any direct ask to Congress. He had one line about more cannons and shells are needed. Presumably, he and President Biden were in more detailed discussions about weapon systems that are in shipment or could be in shipment. Can you give us a sense of what else they could use? Absolutely. So one thing they really need is air defense. We've seen Russia switch to a strategy that is attacking civilian infrastructure, trying to degrade Ukrainian morale by attacking power supply, heat, hot water, any water supply in Ukraine. And it's it's really targeting these civilians with missiles or with Iranian drones. So better air defense would be really helpful. Speaking of the counteroffensive, it would be helpful for the Ukrainians to have longer range munitions. Right now, the HIMARS get you about 60 miles. But what that means is that the Russians have been able to set up their supporting operations just beyond HIMAR range. And unfortunately, that's still close enough to the front line that they can pretty effectively provide supply and do communications and sort of the basic things that you need to continue in your front. That would be much more difficult if Ukraine had a longer range munition that it could drive their supportive positions further back from the front. And then I think also just in terms of really basic things, this is mechanized warfare. It's really brutal. It's really grinding. It's just inherently destructive. And so you see the Ukrainians really burning through tanks. They really need this to continue their counteroffensive. Russia from the get-go has had a huge advantage when it comes to the quantity of artillery and ammunition that they have. So ensuring that the Ukrainians have enough to keep this fight going is really, really important. Kim, one last thought here. Another line I'm hearing often is comparing this or tying this situation in Ukraine to the border crisis on the U.S.-Mexico border and criticisms that Congress seems to care more about Ukraine's border than America's border. And I mean, is that as much of a non sequitur as it Sounds to me, I understand the criticism of the crisis at the border, but Congress could fix the crisis at the border any day it wanted to if Republicans and Democrats could get together and decide on what to do, and they can't. And I don't see how that relates at all to helping a nation stand up to Russia's and Vladimir Putin's aggression. It's a talking point. Obviously, there is an enormous and world of difference between a hostile adversary invading militarily in an organized fashion a neighboring country, and then what we see in the failure of leadership from this White House and the message that it has sent to cause an unprecedented surge of migrants making asylum claims. Those are two very different situations. But at the same time, 
yes, it's absolutely appalling that Joe Biden won't do more on the border, won't enforce the law down there. It's appalling that Congress can't manage to get itself together and pass something that would help or send the message that the border really is closed. And I think the frustrating thing for some of the critics who are making that message and maybe why they resort to this talking point is to also, it signals the degree to which Joe Biden undermines some of the causes that he claims to believe in, for instance, more military aid for Ukraine, by not handling some of the domestic problems and thereby discouraging people to support him in the aims that are worthy. It really is incumbent upon him to get the border under control, and were he to do that, he might find more willingness across the Republican aisle, at least, to help him with some of his own priorities. (laughs) 